Hello, everyone. Today we'll be talking into a microphone, not into a camera. <laughs> We've got lots of things happening. Um, we'll talk about Palestinian movies in the Real Palestine Film Festival, which took place in Dubai. We've got Abu Dhabi Comic Con. And we'll also talk about the Grammys and why it was such a historic night for my girl, Taylor Swift. And we'll have our Man About Town to talk about Emirates Literature Festival and other things that you should be checking out this week. This is Culture Bites coming to you from the National News. I'm Inaz Rafari. And I'm Farah Andrews. So yeah, audio only today. This you, is different. You cannot see us. You cannot see us, which maybe is a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've just... We're in a, it's a transitional week. We'll probably be back to faces on camera next week. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the biggest Palestinian film festival, which happens in the UAE, which I actually managed to get a ticket for, which was lovely. Thank you, Sam. Big shout out to (laughs) Sam, my new friend. Um, So they were screening 12 feature films, four short films. It was, it was very emotional, obviously being there. Um, yeah. I think there was a lot of people who were of Palestinian descent um, and then lots of people who aren't of Palestinian descent, but were there showing solidarity and support. Yeah. Massive, massive event, massive creative event, but also like a massive community event. A lot of people, the film's obviously the real key focus, but a lot of people there kind of like selling artwork, selling fashion items, like bags and pieces um, and food. Um, so you're kind of like very strong Palestinian representation at the festival and in our cars in Dubai. Yeah, really lovely. Um, nice to see Elsa Carl, like, you know, m- being so vibrant. You finally made it down. Is that the first time you went? No, no, I have been before. Okay. I'm maybe actually a huge fan. They did have like a little skims pop up. Yeah, they did. I don't know if it's still there. Would you describe yourself as a skims fan? This is not where I was expecting this conversation. I was not expecting it to go there. Um, am I a skims fan? I have not one item of Skims clothing, which is, for people who don't know, is Kim Kardashian's line. Yeah, it's like um, her um, sort of shapewear line. Very inclusive. It has incredible color representation. Like the mm-hmm, nudes are not mm-hmm. just a pale pink, but it's, uh, yeah, very popular online with the um, with the TikTok crew. Anyway, going back to the film festival. Yes, it's a matter at hand. <laughs> because um, I went to go and see Tomorrow's Freedom, Marwan Barakulti. Um, it was a kind of documentary uh, film about Marwan Barhouti, who is this uh, w- a leader of Fatah, which is the other adjacent party which, mm-hmm. um, to Hamas, which operates mainly in the West Bank. Like real formidable figure in Palestinian politics. And I don't know if you remember that a few years ago, there was like a load of Palestinian prisoners went on hunger strike. He was mm-hmm. one of them. Um, he's been in prison now for quite some time. And it was very much like looking at, you know, his wife's coping mechanism with him being in prison for so long um he's been convicted of murder not that he physically murdered but because of his his being is okay. considered that um but also like it went through you know his his children and i found that really as a mother i think that was really difficult to list to watch because you know here's a man really like I would say what it came across in the film is like a very positive figure there was a lot of similarities between him and Nelson Mandela yeah so I've not seen this film how much so a lot of access to his family then are there direct interviews with him or is it archival footage it's all archival the last um, interview that he did was with ITN um, in the early 2000s and with his family do they talk directly to the Yes. documentary makers yeah so they talk directly and they, you're kind of like taking on this journey with them like you're in the car with his you're in the bus with his wife as she's trying to get to see him in prison okay she's allowed to go once a month and then they just stop it for two years and they don't give her permission um so it's like you know you're going on this very very emotional journey with this family who's actually a really prominent palestinian family mm-hmm. so they're a really prominent palestinian family who've kind of been involved in politics for a really long time like there's lots of pictures of him next to yasser arafat he like the, the opening of the film is him arguing that like there needs to be more female representation in their parliament in the palestinian parliament he's like arguing for it okay. so he's a very kind of like um i would say like I, I mean you know it's not based on religious lines he's not you know it's very much more of a like a political person and then recently in the news like Hamas did say that they wanted him released so he's the 
opposition to them in terms of Palestinian politics. But they've asked for Marwan to be released as part of a negotiation process. Okay. So anyway, really, really timely, really important um, film. So if you do get to see it, um, there's probably other ways you can see it. But yeah, again, that's what I was just about to ask. The, so the film festival has now wrapped. It um, ended this week, but we should try and um, get in the show notes other ways that this film can be watched because it will be showing at plenty of other film festivals and I'm sure it is um, available to buy probably online yeah yeah so again it's called tomorrow's freedom and there is like a website so tomorrowsfreedom.com um and it has got 9.1 on imbd that is that is a high score yes yeah, a high score it's a <laughs> film that was made over five years okay so five real years labor of love. yeah real labor of love so yeah shall we talk about something that's happening in the future well yeah let's do it we have got MEFCC, so the Middle East Film and Comic Con is happening this weekend, which is a very significant event in the kind of um, comic world in this country because Tell it me. brings in an awful lot of big names. Okay, so this is like, I remember when I lived in the UK, it's not a huge thing, Comic Con. Like you to hear about it in the States. So yeah, San Diego is the big, the big one. Yeah. San Diego is where... I believe Comic-Con started and it is definitely the biggest Comic-Con in the world. There is Comic-Con in London, it usually takes place in Wembley, it's pretty big. Um, and then it's been, it's been running here for a very long time. It used to happen in Dubai, but now it's moved over to Abu Dhabi and it is happening this weekend. So from Feb 9th to 11th. Um, and are you excited? Are, yeah. There's big names, there's big names. Go on, tell me, list out some of the big names. So the big hitters, like obviously I'd say... The headliner, our biggest name, is Oscar Isaac. Brilliant actor. Know. Brilliant actor. Yeah. So he is an American actor. He is um he has he plays in the kind of Star Wars spin-off series. Um and he yeah, so he is he's massive. We know Oscar Isaac. I think the Comic Con crew are gonna be the most excited for his role as Poe. So that's kind of gonna be his the well, he's Poe. Yeah, in the Star Wars Star Wars spin-off. Oh, uh. Um, and then we've got a English actress called Sofia Di Martino. Um, she's best known for her role in Loki. I have not watched Loki. Have you? I may have fallen asleep watching it. Okay. I'm one of those people. Don't judge me. There's no judgment. Okay. I'm safe, just safe space. Safe, safe, safe space. I I find it really hard sometimes to stay awake during films. So it means I've seen a lot of half films. So this is. <laughs> this is a TV series. <laughs> I can usually do a TV series. TV series are more pal more digestible, not palatable. I do like digestible. Loki. I do like the whole um I like, I, the, the I, I like the whole Marvel thing. And but so my understanding because I have not seen it, but my understanding is that she plays a Loki variant hey. in another She does. I have seen this. Okay. I do remember this. <laughs> she does. <gasps> Do you want oh, to take the reins? No, you carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Too much that's what I've now. got. <laughs> so yeah, she plays a um, a Loki variant, and then this is what I would the the people I'm most excited about seeing because I am a big Harry Potter fan. So we have James and Oliver Phelps, um, who are most notable for playing Fred and George Weasley in the Harry Potter films, and they're real twins in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not like Lindsay Lohan in The Parent Trap, <laughs> just got them playing the two roles. They're two people. <laughs> They're two people. Ah, oh, fascinating. So one of them's Fred and one of them's George. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if they ever did cheekily swap, because obviously we know that Fred and George are uh, quite mischievous characters. I wonder if James and Oliver ever swap characters and see if they could get Trixie on like J.K. Rowling. Ooh, I think, yeah. Someone asked that question for me. I'm going to ask who I was interviewing <laughs> them on the team. <laughs> I'm I'm really hoping that I can get along to this actually. You are going. Yeah, right? I am gonna go with my daughter. Um she's a huge comic fan. So uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of like comics and like fun things to see. And so do. it is a very 
high energy space. It's very colorful. It's very bright. It's very loud. You've got kind of like areas where people are gaming and then you've got areas where people are selling like comic merch and you have got um, people selling like really incredible artwork. <sighs> then there's like, um, so obviously we've just spoken about a handful of the attendees, but that is not the extent. That is not the extent of the list. Mm. You have like um, voiceover artists and like, actual artists who do the kind of like drawing and the creating like the real creatives that bring the, these worlds to life and so when like for the community people that are just like so invested in it it's a yeah. really nice event for them to kind of go down check out and um have a bit of fun out i think it's also just really good um i did thinking about you know what you take your children to hoping that you inspire them into arts comic con is like lots of different art forms all in one yeah so are you interested in storytelling drawing writing dressing up exactly <laughs> Go. And i think I, as well so like obviously this is very regional for us because it's happening in abu dhabi but it definitely isn't it's um so for the in like international fans of these like film franchises will be like looking out for the panel discussions and interviews all of these big names are taking part in because they'll be talking about into like big projects they'll be announcing things it's a big kind of a. Uh, it's a date in the diary and it is definitely something to look out for if you are a very big fan of these worlds. So yeah, this weekend is a busy one. I can't wait. Let's talk about the Grammys. The Grammys. So Grammys, big. Of, yeah. Always. The biggest. I mean, obviously we're British, so the Brits are significant, but the Grammys really are the musical awards night so it's just music the grammys don't get it confused with all the other awards that are going on this is just about acknowledging the musical successes yeah of the last year musical and audio so like meryl street was nominated for a spoken word thing but so it's it's but it's music um, and like kind of recordings yeah not podcast yet no interestingly they no. should think about that we will maybe get they'll get us on on the, <laughs> on, on the bright on the lights. path to an EGOT. <laughs> <laughs> no. Dream big in us. I, really? I, between us, we could get an EGOT. I could be a Tony Award winner. I love musical theatre. I do not. You do not. I, <laughs> we had, I mean, I've got some friends with Emmys or BAFTAs. Name drop. I, wow, that's, I that's haven't beautiful. name dropped them though. No, don't name drop them. Okay, so. But the Grammys. So massive night. Obviously, it was a very big night. For you. For for my girl. For your girl. So explain to me what happened with Taylor Swift. Why was it so big for her? Taylor Swift had a huge night. She won Best Pop Vocal Album, which is fantastic. She won it for Midnight's. Um, and that was when she um, when she was announcing, when she was picking up the award, she announced another new album. Big surprise. Everyone, so... Taylor Swift fans really enjoy um, kind of picking apart the little clues that she gives and um, the kind of like Easter eggs that she drops. And everyone's expecting the reputation, Taylor Swift, Taylor's version of reputation mm. to be released, right? Okay. Everything, every time she kind of, she's like breadcrumbing, 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 breadcrumbing. She did not. She pulled a blinder and she, instead of, announcing reputation she announced the tortured poets department which is going to be released on april the 19th so that was a very big surprise for the fans and um that is kind of looking like it's going to be a real breakup album um oh because her last relationship fell but now she's got a new relationship she does have a, she has a new boyfriend now so yeah she broke up with joe joe Alwyn, a british actor and it like also all that we have so far is the track list and it does look like there are some very direct songs are going to be about him i love that i know she gets a lot of criticism for it but you know i think that art should be a reflection of your life and what you're going through 100%. so whether it's like a play like if i was to write a play about something that's like you know i don't know it's something just so uh, you unnatural. write what you know right you have to write what you know you have to write things she or has a very good you know. um so she's obviously been asked about this in the past and she's been asked like have you not got more going on than like in these like speaking about these men and she her response is kind of like ed sheeran doesn't get given a hard time for writing about breakups he doesn't mm. get given a hard time for his like like the kind of music he writes about love so why is she because she's a woman mm. she also has a quite a history of quite public romances which is 
I mean, she lives in the public eye. She lives in the public eye. I mean, so, I think any romance you have when you're yeah. Taylor is going to be in the public. So, yeah, so we've been given Tortured Post Department. And then after that, she won Album of the Year. And that was very significant because that's the, her fourth time winning that award, which is Big a record award. breaker. Huge award for her. Yeah. But did you get a little snub from old Jay-Z? So, yeah, I think Was this before being... or after? So, was that announced? Oh, no, was Beyonce never even considered? She was... She was nominated. nominated. So just to g- give you like a bit of backstory, listeners, I think, I think we should. Um, I'm going to fact check. Yeah, I fact check it away. Um, basically, Jay-Z got up on stage and kind of snubbed the Grammys saying, oh, my wife, Beyonce. Do you know Beyonce? Do you know who that is? Um, <laughs> she, yeah, she has never won the great, the best album of the year. Now, I think what is annoying about this is just, first of all, just because you're Beyonce doesn't mean you should get that award, right? Yeah. I, I, we get it but like I'm a pop fan well I'm not even a pop fan but I appreciate pop and I can see that Taylor Swift's album's good but what really hurt was the fact that Kanye West did a similar thing and was totally like you know do you remember yeah, that time do I remember yeah. I'm gonna stop you right there yeah so and it really affected Taylor and Beyonce was one of those characters in that mix who like comforted Taylor so I don't understand now. I just think that we need these men to stop standing up and making these statements when Beyonce can speak for herself. She very much chooses not to do interviews. She has made mm. silence part of her brand. Did she produce the best album of this year? No. Then that's it. End, end. end of story. And I, I, it's kind of like the conversation with Leonardo DiCaprio. It's like, did he... Yeah, he's a phenomenal actor. But he, she is, he, doesn't, he didn't just deserve an Oscar for being Mm. Leonardo DiCaprio he had to put in the best performance that year otherwise you just you make a mockery of the award system not that like I'm not saying that like you should judge your talent based on awards you're a real Grammys purist I'm just like (laughs) you know you gotta you gotta you gotta work but yeah I and I just I think Jay-Z's speech wasn't that deep but I also think that if I was Beyonce sitting there I'd be like please be quiet just stop just stop now. Okay, other highlights. Oh, there from- is one more thing I need to say. This is actually very big news this morning. Um, last night she announced that the Eras tour is going to be coming to a streamer. Ah. So it was in cinemas last year and then it's been like, is it going to be streamed? Is it going to be streamed? Is it going to be streamed? No, it was not streamed, but you could pay to rent it quite a lot of money. It was like $20 to rent it for like a, two days on, uh, on Apple and Apple, Apple TV. And I... Would like to show my restraint. (laughs) I did not do it because twenty dollars for two days is silly. You can Um, probably buy it now. Well, maybe you could. Yeah, you'll be able to buy it. Um, But it's now. It's coming to um, Disney Plus. It's coming on the fifteenth of March. So another date for the Swifties Diary. And we've done some like maths over here in the arts and culture department of the National and. Based on the time that things usually drop on Disney Plus, it will be out at 10 a.m. on the 15th here, if it follows the usual pattern. Uh, so don't expect me to be doing anything for three hours from 10 a.m. on the 15th of March. <laughs> Just block that out in my diary because it's a Friday. Out. <laughs> Other big things that happened at the Grammys were, of course, Annie Lennox, Scottish artist who called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Incredibly, the first artist who has spoken directly about the ceasefire so far in awards season. Oh, that wow. Really? hurts my brain. No. On stage, the first person who has said it. Oh, wow. Well done, Annie. Annie's always been there for it, though. She's yeah. She's been campaigning for, and um, she used, rights for a long time. Um, she was, it was during the tribute, the in memoriam to Sinead O'Connor, and that just feels so fitting because this is definitely a cause that Sinead O'Connor would have cared incredibly deeply about and she would have been super outspoken about we can't put words in her mouth but kind of like her kind of historical political leanings this is something she would have cared deeply about um definitely Sinead was definitely that yeah and so Annie Lennox was amazing and there were a few other um firsts well I was going to say Gaza references oh uh, were there yeah. I, was there anything on the red carpet that's usually somewhere people would like to display solidarity ding 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 hello um, the three members of the super group um, Boy Genius wore artists for ceasefire pins nice yeah. nice I kind of went through the red carpet pictures quite meticulously to see if there was anybody else wearing it but I couldn't see it 
Um, if I'm wrong, someone please tell me because I would like I would like to know who's wearing those pins. But as far as I can see, it was just those three artists. Okay. Um, we also had a first for Tyler, the South African singer who's blowing up at the moment. Absolutely amazing. The, um, yeah, so the first African African Music Performance Award, I think. There we go, yeah. The Grammys has such sp- specific wording in their awards names, um, but it was the first time that award has been given out. Um, first song, Water, I believe. It's a banger. It is a banger. Mm-hmm. Absolutely huge on TikTok and Instagram, which it's is huge. how you make a song huge now. Yeah. I've seen that a lot, of, a lot of artists are really trying to break that TikTok kind of like repetitive dance thing. And that's exactly what she did. So the, the, the song came out a while ago, but it was only when she got involved with a choreographer that it really blew up. And I didn't know that. yeah, so it was a choreographer that helped it blow up. And then you kind of had like everyone kind of repeating like, yeah, the motif. Exactly. Maybe that's how we get our Grammy. I don't think I'm ready for that. No one's ready for that. Well, you could be. Tyler was. <laughs> <laughs> She's only 22. She's got way more energy. And um, we've also got India's Zakir Hussain's win, Supergroup win, 2024 Grammy for first album in nearly five decades. Yeah, so they last produced music in the 70s. They produced, I love this. It was 46 years ago. Don't give up, people. See, like, maybe there is time for us. And then they kind of, um, I believe they disbanded and then they came back together. And yeah, they got a they got a Grammy. I love that. I need to listen to this album as well. Um, so yeah, that was a, what a great um, little Grammy award. Have you watched Miley Cyrus performing Flowers? I have not watched that yet. Is, is, did, did she not complain to the crowd? She told them, she was like, as if you don't know the words, sing along. Ah! I love Shade. It. I love it. Shade. Was everybody just too cool in the front row? Like, we're not going to sing along. Do you know who wasn't? Taylor Swift. She always stands up and she sings every <laughs> word and I absolutely love it. <laughs> Yo when, girl. when Tracy Chapman and is he called Luke, Luke performed uh, Fast Car mm. and Taylor was just like there in the audience just like they keep panning to her and she is just like standing there swaying and singing every word she loved it that girl is a hype girl Luke Combs Luke Combs that's right. um, she I'm is not a, a big country fan I'm not a big country fan either I have to admit I love that song by Tracy Chapman oh. though have you seen it's cup? It's got shot up to number yeah, one. Yeah, shot up to number one out off the back of the Grammys. So well done the Grammys for getting Tracy. Is it Tracy's well version the... or Luke? It's Tracy's. Amazing. Well done the Grammys, the biggest night in music for spotlighting the biggest songs. The biggest songs. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, right. So next thing, I've put this on the running order. I love um, it. You don't, I mean, is this is this even culture? Who knows? It's internet culture. It's internet culture. We want to talk a bit about internet culture. So it's weirdly, it's something that I'm fascinated with. I, I'm actually really like quite deep into like the anthropology of internet culture. Oh yeah. Okay. I watch essays about it on YouTube. Ah! Would you say that that feeds into what you're about to talk to? Probably. As yes. Your base flag. It probably is. So there's this thing going around online. Um, you may have heard of a red flag. Red flag is when you're about to date someone, maybe you're dating them, and they do something that might eat you, and, yeah. then, and then you know oh, that's a red flag. Yeah, we know what a red flag that's is. That's a red flag. Some people choose to ignore them. Some people choose to collect them. Some people fly them <laughs> like bunting. But we know what red flags are. We all know what a red flag is. A red flag is that guy who is still best friends with their ex. Is that a red flag? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've been out of the gay- dating game for so long. Um, but we have dun, 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 beige flags. So tell me what a beige flag is, please, Ines. Okay. This is like my favorite thing ever because a beige flag is what makes you, what is boring? What's boring? So it's like the boring things that any prospective partner are basically going to have to live with. Yeah, you need to know this about me. This is like my boring thing. Because when you're talking to someone new, you can be like, oh, I'm like, I read, I read these like novels and yeah, I I'm so to fascinating. Music. I'm so deep. Yeah, I'm so deep. I'm varied. I contain multitudes. Yeah, I'm like, I do trips barefoot. You I go tra- to Bhutan. You, <laughs> you wear cashmere. I, these are just a few facts. <laughs> just a few facts about Farah. Okay, and... Um, but then there's also this other side of your personality, which everybody has, which is your beige flags. Yeah. Yeah. And my beige flags, maybe that's my anthropology um, essays. Maybe that's... Sociology of the internet. Sociology And of fascination the with it. But I don't think that's... That's not boring. Okay. So maybe that's not boring. Also, I could hype it, but I have got a very boring beige flag. Yeah. Tell us. <laughs> I don't know if I, I'm ready. I love it. So I really enjoy watching cleaning videos. 
You and but you're with the the internet is with you. The internet is there for me. Mrs. Hinch is massive for a reason. Mm -hmm. And specifically, so I do. I did get into like the first time I started watching these kind of like weird videos was um, car cleaning. Okay, right. But now this has moved on to carpet cleaning. Car. She's <laughs> added pet on the end. <laughs> She's car evolved. Pet. She's evolved. I mean, though, some of those carpet cleaning companies, number one. Props to their social media teams that were like, this should be shared with the world because this is satisfying. And number two, just those videos, they are, what a watch. I just love a reveal, you know? Yeah. I love a reveal. I want to watch something. I want there to be a reveal. There's a, oh, what is that filthy mask? We don't know, but oh, it's yellow. It's a yellow carpet. I know. So they're the ones that come in that are like smudgy, dark, black, Brown, See, you've gray. Been down this hole. I've fallen down this rabbit hole. I've okay, been there. Fine. I'm with you. So it's not. It, it, no, but it's still quite beige. It's very beige. Um, <laughs> what's what's your beige flag? Come on, Farah. I have probably have a couple. Let's be real. I mean, yesterday I bored you about how much water I drank all day. <laughs> so you might have heard like my I've had too much liquid anecdote about five times to different people yeah so if i had too much liquid and spoke about it for the whole day guys it really knocked me off kilter <laughs> <laughs> I was what's, really in, what's really interesting about culture bites and we did say this at the beginning of this series um this podcast was that this was our friendship also unfolding and so Inash just wasn't podcast. expecting to get water no, reports i wasn't expecting that but yeah so that is your so that's one beige flag. Another, um, I'm obsessed, obsessed with how much sleep I'm going to get. It isn't necessarily, um, a, it's potentially a form of anxiety because I get to kind of like seven o'clock and then I'm like, right, well, I need to still need to like walk the dog, I need to make dinner, I need to wash dinner. I want to like unwind for a little bit, but that's kind of taking me to like dangerously close to half 10, which is dangerously close to 11, which is dangerously close to me not getting eight hours. It occupies my mind from basically when I close my laptop at work and get home. <laughs> You're s that, it's that is it, so beige. It is. Yeah, it just, is. Just, just live in the moment. No, I can't. I have to know how many hours sleep are coming. <laughs> I have got this theory, my husband will say this, that any, like, so an hour before midnight, any hour sleep before midnight counts as two. So if I sleep like 11 to 12, that's like two hours sleep, not one. That's my theory. So the more sleep I do before 12, the better it is for me. You've ruined me because now I'm oh, going to no, try another and like doubling. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you've turned this into algebra. Um, oh. Last night I went to bed at half midnight and honestly I'm it's, out it's just sorts. another day where I'm out of sorts oh uh, no <laughs> here we go we'll hear about it more and more it's because I went to go see Hamilton again last night I just I have no words <laughs> it was worth it it was worth uh, not getting enough sleep to go watch Hamilton twice in one week love it hey so we've brought man in a man about town hi man hi hello hi. go on going? quickly quickly Beige flag. Um, I'm really confused because one person's beige flag is another person's red flag, potentially. Potentially. Whoa. Right? It depends what... No. No, that's... I, mm, that's no. No? I'd it's say a, one person's beige flag is another person's, like, they actually find it quite interesting. Like, a, they're green flag. Yeah. And what I'm saying is it's very subjective. It, of course it's it is. quite yeah. subjective. I would just... I think if a beige flag is going into red flag, then it's probably not a beige flag. Yeah, then you're kind of looking at maroon flag and that's just... <laughs> that's, <laughs> probably, that's troublesome. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> I really thought hard about it and I think maybe, like, is this a beige flag? You guys can tell me, like, I don't like my fruit room temperature I always have my fruit cold is this a beige flag <laughs> but does it does that occupy quite a lot of your time yeah like would like, a prospective partner have to like really know that about you and yeah and, because if they give me a room temperature apple I'll probably throw it in their face like right oh, okay this, yeah then just no, oh, no. that potentially that is bordering into red flags he's getting violent pretty beige <laughs> that is, it, is that beige, beige? Yeah, I thought, oh that's a bit eccentric but or maybe no. it's like no, it's kind of beige. Does it? Oh, so as long as it's like occupying quite a lot of your mind. It does. I think like the fruits are in the house. Like let's put them in the freezer or the fridge. Like let's not leave them out. Fruit flies and all that. But So um, you can't deal with warm fruit. It's weird. A room temperature fruit. Have you ever had an orange from the freezer? It's amazing. I've heard that grapefruit from the freezer is basically sorbet. It's, it's Ditto so grapes. That's like, I. this is troublesome territory, but Victoria Beckham uses that as like a, a diet technique. Ah, uh, 
which is I do I do love um you know like in I used to live in Damascus and in Damascus obviously but in Damascus they used to serve grapes with ice yeah because and, and I yeah. love it's that. so good it's especially so, in the summer yeah yeah it's yeah. like cold grapes mm. I like an olive served on ice oh I've never had what? that wonderful it <gasps> is good like a stuffed olive or whatever however you present your oh, olives that's nice. you present them on ice like an like a, like a little vegetarian oyster yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love that yeah so man tell us inform us what is going on this week what should we be looking out for where have you been so i'll talk first about where i've been and last weekend this gone just gone was the emirates airline festival of literature yes. it was the 16th year that the event has happened and it was really really cool there were so many sessions lots of interesting authors locally regionally internationally uh, and they i went to a couple of really interesting sessions one was about this author that i recently discovered called martin puchner or mm -hmm. Puckner, if you're German. Uh, and he wrote a book about culture. It's called Culture, the Story of Us from Cave Art to K-Pop. And he basically Ooh. wrote, yeah, what a great name, I'm right? In. Yeah, yeah. So each chapter is dedicated to like a certain like aspect of culture, whether it's like the bust of Nefertiti, you know, that famous mm, sculpture of Nefertiti, yeah. or like an individual like this um, Chinese Buddhist monk in the seventh century who traveled to India for seven, for 16 years and um, translated all of these Hindu scripts and took them back to China. So he'll, he'll kind of focus on this one specific story and then um, talk about its history and its context and kind of how that relates to culture in the bigger sense. So what happens when we discover a cave that's been covered up and we see all of these prehistoric paintings and it changes what we thought we knew about culture, right? Mm -hmm. Or what happens when you unearth something from Pompeii, uh, you know, the, the village that was, mm -hmm. yeah, or city, town. And what does that tell us about culture? So he he's interested in this idea of um, we think we are always, um, what's the word when you give to next generation? Sorry. Um, inheriting. And, you know, when you're, we're inheriting culture all the time. So he's really interested in this idea of inherited culture. And actually, we think we're always inheriting culture, but it's always being interrupted. Stuff happens, whether it's war or nature or volcanoes erupting, that we forget about certain culture and we remember others. Actually, the most interesting thing that he said was that the biggest danger to culture is not war or natural disasters. It's actually us forgetting about oh. things because once we deem something as not interesting or important it gets kind of forgotten about and and you know thrown on the wayside yeah. i'm gonna argue against that oh. I, uh, yeah futurist over here i just i just think that like that's the the nature of these things yes, yes. so i think that like we are we cannot carry everything moving yeah forward. we can't of course. have He's, and we he was he that. was saying that it's all he's like culture is curated all the time. Yeah. It's so. like a totally like evolving ball of yeah. amazingness. And I think it's interesting we're talking about this now, like him looking back, because this links in very well with me and my little like internet culture yeah. that I'm obsessed with. I think like um looking at how things are always evolving mm. is like fascinating. It but is the really very fascinating. strange thing about the way that this era, literally from like the 70s forward is going to be interpreted in the future is that everything is documented yeah mm. especially from like like 2000s we have documented every single one of our thoughts on the internet or have had the opportunity to document every single one of our thoughts on the internet i hope people are doing that still but it, of course they are like they always will be yeah. like every, there's even if it's evolved away from the farah andrews is feeling not thirsty <laughs> which would have been my facebook status in 2006 um we've moved away from that sure but like we are still like i mean look mm. at us we've literally found a way <laughs> to put ourselves in a sound booth and sound off for an hour every yeah. single week and that's recorded and then we've got like as journalists of course we've we are always journaling and there's yeah. always documenting and then that's that's not something that's new but then there's like Everybody else is documenting and journaling, like it, whether they are people of like actual note or if they're just like the average person that puts every single thought out and hopes that they're loud enough and then it's going to stick and it's just, it's going to be there. And it's a slightly terrifying abundance. Well, he was saying that there's actually, there's this idea that some cultural artifacts are safer in some places than others. Like, you know, things from Egypt or Iraq are safer in the UK or in the US because of like war or whatever. But what he's actually saying is that that's kind of like a farce and that's not okay, true okay, because mm -hmm. because actually the, the uh, bust of Nefertiti uh, has been in Berlin since 1913. Berlin was in the middle of two world wars and that museum that she was in um, was was bombed twice. He's like, 
is it safer there? No. He's like, nothing is actually safe anywhere around the world. If you really want to keep culture safe, it's better to leave it underground because no one's touching it there. Yeah, the safest place would have been where it was for thousands of years. Yeah. So Literally. what you're saying, Farah, is actually like, yeah, we're, we're journaling everything. Everything's up in the ether. But what if one day, like... um the cloud disappears, right? Like what, it's like, it's interesting. That's a conversation we're having a lot at the moment um, in the office and we're kind of putting into stories about the insecurity of virtual art because like they're kind of like, sure, we, we've, we've literally just spoken about Taylor Swift putting her Aeros tour onto streamers. Mm. But unless you've got a physical copy mm. of it, there's no guarantee, like she can take it off two days after she puts it on and then no one, own like no one else no owns, one owns it. The only that. person who owns it is her, and so unless we literally, so so we've spoke, we've got the kind of like conversation about physical art, art and yeah. collecting physical art, whether that is books or TV DVDs, VHSs have made like this comeback. incredible comeback. Mm. This is a massive tangent. VHSs. Did you know that Pete Davidson of Pete Davidson fame, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> has like he's in process of buying every vhs that's available to buy in the u.s because he wow. thinks that it's going to make such a big comeback he's probably right yeah what why over dvd because it's like the vintage the cool well it's yeah it's very cyclical everyone always looks back and even like in fashion trends they always end up looking back and whatever's been was interesting before becomes relevant now better whip out my old ipod <laughs> i need to find a dvd player can you still buy them yes yeah i'm sure you can i mean we've got a playstation i mean we have <laughs> I've not got a PlayStation. <laughs> Eddie has a PlayStation. <laughs> and like, and I've been informed that I can watch DVDs on that. Well, this is interesting. This has like sparked a conversation. Yeah, well it? done, man. One, one more thing I'll say that he said that's interesting. It's a short thing. But he said the best way to protect all of this stuff is not through museums or archiving. It's through education. Like Lovely. teaching people the importance of Taylor Swift putting everything on streaming. <laughs> teaching incredible. people about whatever it is. Because that's, that's how... My mission, that's my mission. <laughs> that's <calling>. your mission. <laughs> that's who I am. So yeah, he's like, education is the most important thing. And it's up to, and I quote him verbatim when I talk to him, it's up to us lecturers and teachers and up to you journalists. And I was like, that is so true. We are saving the world. We are educating Oh, people. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, want, and you left that interview with pep in your step. <laughs> yeah. I was like, thanks, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. What else have you been up to? Tell us. So I went to a really interesting uh, gallery exhibition. It is um, in a gallery in Al Khayat Avenue. So I don't think I've spoken about Al Khayat Avenue before on here, but it is. Have I? No, no but Nas has just made it to Al Sakal, so she's going to have I'm, a headache. Yeah, I've oh. got I've got more more places to go. Yeah. So Al Khayat, you, you've been to you, you've just recently gone to Al Sakal. I've no, been, a been a few of times. times. Oh. Come on, guys. Okay. It's just at the Sorry. beginning. You every time it came up. Sorry. I'm, okay. I'm calling back to outdated <laughs> information. So, so tell me about this new place I need to go to. So Al Khayat Avenue is right in front of, across the road from Al Sakala Avenue. It's a smaller kind of space, but and it has lots of different galleries and art spaces. So I went to a gallery there called El Nika Project Art Space, and it is a conceptual art gallery. So it's all the artists there are tend to be more conceptual artists. They currently have a show right now called I Can No Longer Produce the Limits of My Own Body. It's running until February 24th. It is a show of all female artists, six female artists uh, from the region, and I think two, one from Greece and one from Austria. And it is all about the human body in different lights and forms. And I want to focus on two artists that I think are really interesting. The first one is called, um, she's Lebanese, Beirut-based artist called Dalia Khalife. And she is hmm. an artist. She also does a lot of dance, even though she's not a professionally trained um, dancer. But she has this really interesting installation where there is a... Um, avatar of her, an AI avatar that she designed that looks very realistic and it's like to the height of a normal person that you speak to and you give them like a word, there's like a little chart next to the screen, like sad, anxious, angry, happy, ecstatic. And based on the word that you tell her, she will do a dance movement that interprets that word, which I think is really interesting. And it's all based on like algorithms and things like that. And then next to that, there's another screen where there's um, her, the, the artist, Dahlia, dancing and right next to her is another screen it's, it's one screen that's split into one of her dancing and one is her ai dancing and it's kind of a race to see who's going to get tired more and it's all about this idea of Ooh. does our avatar version like have more energy get more tired like it's well, really they, interesting i mean 
they obviously oh, that's a he- can that keep going. giving me a headache because it, if there was an Avatar version of Fire, she would probably be getting quite a lot more done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's really interesting to watch them both at the same time dancing and moving. And yeah, and how you see the real Dahlia sweat as she's dancing and the other one like pretending to sweat. Like it's this weird notions of what is real, what's not. And, you know, sweating is a very like human oh. thing. Yeah. Oh. But the the installation there that I keep thinking about is by this artist called Sara Nirobakhish. She's Iranian and she was born in like a village on the Iranian-Iraqi border. And she has this show called Tabalavor, which means um, crystallization. So she, her mother um, got diagnosed with cancer and passed away very quickly. And in a way for her to work through her grief, So in her village, when uh, you bury someone, you bury them in these very big vases, like very big terracotta vases. Mm -hmm. So she got some of her mother's like intimate um, objects, like her mother's wedding shoes, a photo frame of her mother. And she started to crystallize them. So she used this kind of, you know, you've seen those um, blue crystal that you can kind of create through a sign. Yeah. Yeah. So she created one of those kits, but using saffron, because saffron is like a very popular Mm -hmm. uh, spice in the Middle East and in Iran. And she put all of these different objects, her mother's shoes, her mother's photo frame, uh, a chair her mother used to sit on. She crystallized all of it. So in a way, she wants to crystallize her mother, the, the intimate parts of her mother. And she also discovered that this kind of crystallization helps apparently to um, take out tumors. Her mother had a can- tumor, cancerous oh. tumor. So it's that link. But the really interesting part is that she did a performance that she videoed in 2020 of her going in those terracotta pots that people get buried in, and she crystallized herself. So she filled the whole, oh. yeah, she filled the whole thing with this crystal liquid. And over a couple of hours, you see her body starting to crystallize. And then at some point when she couldn't handle it anymore, because it's quite painful, it kind of burns your skin. She got cracked out of it. And you, the whole thing's on video. Did and she emerge as a butterfly? She basically, it's kind of like an idea of rebirth mm. because all this liquid comes out and it's her thinking about grief, thinking about how you become a different person after a parent passes away. It is a kind mm. of a rebirth. And even watching them crack her out of this um, terracotta pot, it looks almost like something like a rebirth. Mm. And at first I was like, what is this? And I was just watching Then, As I read about it, I kept thinking about it because color was so red and they've, they've, planned it like a room. It's one big black wall, all of these um, house items like the shoes, the chair, the photo frame, and then the screen in the middle of this happening. It's just something I just keep, keep coming back and thinking about. It's really, really interesting, powerful. Oh, I'm definitely going to have to. You um, have to check it out. And, and yeah. Get down there. So yeah, oh, so that's, sure. I, I think everybody should go see it. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. No worries. Yeah. Well, Always thank you so much. <laughs> Well, that's a lot to pack in for this week. Thank you so much for everybody who joined us. And if you like this episode, please follow and subscribe on your favourite podcasting app. And don't forget to tell all your friends and family about it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.